My name is Don Park and I'm an assistant clinical professor here at the UCLA Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I'm also the vice chair for quality and safety for the department. I'm a member of the UCLA Comprehensive Spine Center and I'll be talking today about what to expect with spine surgery. Be sure to ask questions on Twitter with hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. The information presented here is specific to my spine practice at UCLA, so be sure to discuss with your spine surgeon about specific preferences and expectations before and after surgery. When is spine surgery necessary? For me, spine surgery is necessary when you have persistent pain and symptoms due to spinal cord and or spinal nerve compression. That can lead to radiating pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness. It can also lead to difficulty in walking and balance, and your function can be impaired in many ways. You can also have instability of the spine that can lead to surgery. One of the most uh, frequent questions that I get asked is how to best prepare for surgery. The best way is to maintain the best physical and mental health as you can. And this is by maintaining a healthy diet and having regular exercise. I always tell patients, the stronger you are before surgery, the stronger you will be after surgery, and your recovery will reflect this. Whatever your symptoms, and even if it is difficult, try to walk as much as you can, because this can help maintain your conditioning and help improve your post-operative recovery. If you do smoke, please stop smoking, because this can impair healing from both a medical and surgical perspective. And if you can, avoid having uh, the cold or flu before surgery. If you have cold or flu symptoms, then you should alert and notify your surgeon as soon as possible prior to surgery. What about medications before surgery? You should wean down on opioid pain medications as much as you can, as much as you can to help with uh, pain control after surgery, as well as muscle relaxants. You can continue with prescription, pain me or prescription medications such as blood pressure medications as directed by your primary care physician as well as your surgeon. Medications to avoid would be any blood thinners uh, because you're having spine surgery, any bleeding that is uncontrollable after spine surgery in the spinal area can lead to consequences and dangers and blood thinners and anti-inflammatories can contribute to this. So you should stop uh, these medications seven days before surgery. Taking medications such as Advil, Motrin, Aleve, these are over-the-counter medications but still can be uh, blood thinning as well. So you should stop this. Prescription anti-inflammatories such as Indomethacin or Indocin, Meloxicam or Mobic, Diclofenac or Voltaren, those can also cause bleeding. Definitely aspirin, which inhibits your platelets, can cause bleeding as well. Heparin, Lovenox, Coumadin, blood thinners, uh, especially for uh, uh, heart conditions like atrial fibrillation, should be stopped seven days before surgery. And other medications like Agronox and Eliquis and Plavix, which are related to heart conditions, can also be uh, uh, blood thinners and place patients at risk around surgery. Herbal medications, if they do cause uh, uh, your blood to thin, should be avoided as well. And this is difficult to ascertain sometimes in terms of the uh, properties of these herbal medications. So the general rule of thumb is to try to avoid taking any herbal medications before surgery. In terms of the preoperative process, it starts with first scheduling surgery with your surgeon. And we'll be going over the various steps of this. The first step is obtaining preoperative medical clearance. And this is with your primary care physician to begin with and any of your specialists that are taking care of you, such as a cardiologist or a pulmonologist. You would obtain baseline tests, such as a complete blood count, chemistry panel, coagulation tests, an EKG, and perhaps even have specialized tests, such as a chest x-ray, echocardiogram, and a cardiac stress test. And all of this is to ask, answer the question, are you healthy enough to have surgery? And so these uh, tests and this clearance will help us understand that and to stratify your risk for surgery. The next step is the preoperative clinic visit. And I typically see patients one month prior, within one month prior to surgery. And that is to make sure that the preoperative medical clearance is complete, 
also to finalize a surgical plan and determine uh, the steps of the surgery that are necessary to uh, have a successful outcome. We will be discussing the risks, benefits, and alternatives of surgery and obtain informed consent for surgery. I typically obtain an electronic consent that is uploaded into our electronic medical records so that it is stored there, so that we can obtain the consent uh, at any place the medical record is found. The next step is to finalize the schedule, and that is the day before surgery, you should expect a telephone call from the preoperative unit confirming the surgery time, as well as when to arrive to the hospital and where to check in. Patients should avoid eating or drinking anything after midnight on the night prior to surgery. Medications with tiny sips of water is okay prior to surgery on the morning of surgery if necessary, such as if you need to take blood pressure medications to help control your blood pressure before surgery. And please take a deep breath. You are having surgery, but you'll be prepared for having this. And the next final step would be checking in uh, with the admissions office and the preoperative unit uh, prior to going to have surgery. These are the common surgeries that I perform uh, on a daily basis. And I'll be discussing these surgeries and the post-operative course uh, of these uh, surgeries and what to expect. Anterior cervical surgery, such as anterior cervical discectomy infusion or ACDF surgery, as well as cervical disc replacement surgery is commonplace. Posterior cervical surgery, such as cervical laminectomy, laminectomy infusion, or laminoplasty, as well as laminoframinotomy, is also common. Extremely common surgeries are lumbar microdiscectomy, laminotomy, foraminotomy, laminectomy to help decompress spinal nerves, as well as even lumbar fusion. I'll be discussing the risks of spine surgery uh, in general. And although this is a difficult topic oftentimes to discuss with patients because of the potential consequences of surgery, it is important to understand to have proper informed consent prior to surgery. The risks include bleeding, infection, wound problems, nerve damage, blood vessel damage, incomplete resolution of pain and symptoms, continued pain and symptoms, malunion, which means that the bones don't heal together right, or nonunion, where it does not heal together at all. This is for fusion surgeries. Instability caused by the surgery, needing more surgery afterwards. Recurrent pain and symptoms and pathology such as disc herniations that come back even despite a successful surgery can happen. Implant failure, need for further surgery in the future. For cervical surgeries, airway problems, esophageal injuries, or cervical nerve root palsies. These are relatively uncommon but can occur um, you know, after cervical surgery. Neurological deterioration and deficit, even spinal cord injury and paralysis, although these are very unlikely to occur. They are in the realm of possibilities. Spinal fluid leak, anesthesia risks, and medical complications, such as blood clots, heart attack, stroke, pneumonia, and even death. These are the comprehensive list of risks regarding spinal surgery. And although it is difficult to talk about and hear prior to surgery, it is crucial to understand what the risks are before you go into having spine surgery. Now that we're done with the difficult part, we'll go into the post-operative course of these surgeries. Typically, patients after surgery will get out of bed the day of surgery and try to walk as much as they can and work with physical therapy either, either the day of or the day after surgery. In terms of restrictions, I typically have patients uh, avoid extremes of motion, such as bending, twisting with their neck or back, any heavy lifting, more than 10 to 15 pounds. I always recommend to follow the BLTs, which is an easier way to remember, which is no bending, lifting, or twisting. And please remember to walk as much as you can, because this is the best way of helping through a recovery and improving your condition after surgery. In terms of anterior cervical surgery, which is ACDF, where we take bone uh, and, or a cage and place it into the disc space and secure them with titanium plates and screws, such as seen here, this is to address a disc herniation or bone spurs that are compressing spinal cord and, and spinal nerves. There's also a cervical disc replacement, which we use for titanium and polyethylene 
uh, implants, such as seen down here, which helps maintain motion of the uh, neck while still decompressing the disc space and relieving the problems uh, from the disc herniation or bone spurs. What to expect with these surgeries is that it's typically an outpatient surgery. Patients can stay overnight. A surgical drain is typically removed prior to discharge, either uh, the day of or the day after surgery. And a collar may be worn after surgery, depending on the type of surgery performed. For a single level ACDF or one to two level disc replacement, I typically use a soft collar just for comfort for two weeks. For multi-level ACDF, I would use an Aspen collar, which provides more immobilization for four to six weeks to allow for the soft tissues as well as the bone to heal after surgery. This is the typical timeline of recovery after anterior cervical surgery. Typically at two weeks, uh, a wound check will be performed in clinic. At two to four weeks, patients start physical therapy and home exercises. At four to six weeks, patients are about 60 to 70 percent recovered. And at six weeks, I see them in clinic and obtain x-rays to make sure everything looks uh, uh, good as compared to the uh, post-operative x-rays in the hospital. At six to eight weeks, patients are approximately 80 to 90 percent recovered. And at eight to 12 weeks, they're 90 to 100 percent recovered uh, after surgery. At the 12-week point, I typically obtain x-rays again and check to see how patients are doing. I also check at the six-month and yearly uh, points after surgery. In terms of posterior cervical surgery, this includes cervical laminectomy, laminectomy infusion. This surgery involves removal of the bony lamina, which is in the back of the neck, to help decompress the spinal cord. And you can use screws and rods to help uh, with fusion so that uh, there's no instability after this. There's also cervical laminoplasty, where you hinge open the lamina, as seen here, to help expand the space for the spinal cord here. And we can use these tiny plates and screws to help open that space. And this is to help decompress the spinal cord. And the final surgery we'll be discussing is the laminoframinotomy, which is drilling a hole to open the space for the spinal nerve as it's being pinched right at the opening. And this helps to relieve the uh, nerve pain that can occur. For these surgeries, uh, what to expect are widely different. For cervical laminectomy and fusion, it can be a two to three day stay. It can be a little difficult after surgery because of post-operative pain. It does hurt when uh, you have to do surgery in the back of your neck because of all the muscles that are attached to the bones in the back of your neck. For cervical laminoplasty and laminoframinotomy, then it's, it can be an outpatient surgery or an overnight stay. But typically, uh, the pain is not as difficult to recover from. The collar is also different depending on the surgery. So for laminoplasty and laminoframinotomy, a soft collar is used for comfort for two weeks. However, for laminectomy infusion, an aspen collar will be used for four to six weeks to allow for the pain to resolve, the, the inflammation and swelling to resolve, and uh, to allow for bony healing as well. <clears throat> this is a typical timeline for cervical laminectomy infusion. And as you can see, it takes longer to recover from. So at about four to six weeks, the patients are about 40 to 50% recovered, both from pain as well as function. And it does improve day by day, week by week. At six to eight weeks, it's 60 to 70%. At eight to 12 weeks, 80% recovered. And by three to six months, 90 to 100% recovered by about six months. And by six months to one year, patients should be uh, hopefully back to their uh, normal state depending on how debilitated they are before surgery. Now this is the typical timeline for laminoplasty and laminoframinotomy. And as you can see, it's faster recovery. By four to six weeks, patients are 60 to 70% recovered, and 80% recovered by six to eight weeks, 90 to 100% recovered by eight to 12 weeks. And I typically see them in regular intervals, uh, similar to the other surgeries. But it can be a faster recovery. Now we'll switch gears to lumbar decompression surgery. One of the surgeries that I would perform commonly is lumbar microdiscectomy, where a disc herniation here is pushing on a nerve that's causing nerve pain. And so I would remove the disc fragments that are herniated out and comp compressing the nerve and decompress that nerve. 
and it's a highly successful surgery. Lam lumbar laminotomy and foraminotomy is another surgery where it is uh, to remove the bone or ligaments that are squeezing and compressing the nerves and is to help decompress those nerves. And then lumbar laminectomy is to uh, open up the space for the nerves within the spinal canal completely um, to uh, allow for the spinal nerves to be decompressed. What to expect for these surgeries? For microdiscectomy and laminotomy, this is an outpatient surgery. You can go home the same day. For laminectomy, it can be either outpatient to one to two days stay, depending on how comprehensive the surgery was, how many levels we did in terms of surgery, and uh, whether you have a drain in place surgically afterwards to help remove excess bleeding. Typically, there's no bracing necessary for these surgeries, and there are restrictions for four weeks, with no bending, lifting, or twisting, and no sitting for long periods of time, such as 45 minutes or an hour, um, to help reduce the stress in your, in your spine. And this would be for four weeks, and after the four-week point, then you would go back to your normal activities as you can tolerate. The typical post-operative recovery is fast with the lumbar laminectomy and laminotomy. By four to six weeks, patients are 80% recovered. And by six weeks, they're 90%. By eight weeks, hopefully 100% recovered. And so patients can recover from this quickly. And I usually see them by six weeks. And after that point, if they're doing well, then I don't see them again unless they're having issues. So they're seen as needed. For lumbar laminectomy, it does take longer. And so it takes time to get to um, uh, this 40 to six, uh, 60 to 70 percent uh, recovery, about four to six weeks for that. 80 percent recovery is six to eight weeks, and then eight to 12 weeks for 90 plus to 100 percent recovery. And I typically see them at the three month point and any point afterwards if necessary um, after surgery. We'll talk about lumbar fusion surgery, which is a bigger surgery um, depending on what is done. The goals of surgery is to decompress the spinal nerves and to stabilize the spine if there's any instability, as seen here, where you can see the bones are slipped forward one on top of the other here, and that is causing the bones to uh, rub against each other and also compress nerves. And so if it's unstable, then it requires stabilization, and the stabilization requires fusion. There's various approaches and techniques that are performed where you can go and do surgery from the front of the spine, the side of the spine, the back of the spine. You can do it open where you make a bigger incision or minimally invasive where you make smaller incisions. But ultimately you're accomplishing the same goal, which is to decompress the spinal nerves and to stabilize the spine to create fusion. And you can do this through bone graft with cages or screws and rods like seen here. So what to expect with this is typically a one to two day stay in my practice, and it, you know, uh, depending on how invasive the surgery is. It can be uh, shorter with for minimally invasive surgery, such as one day for minimally invasive surgery, or two days for more open surgery. And bracing may be needed depending on uh, the uh, extent of the surgery as well as the bone quality. So if there's osteoporosis involved, and the bone quality is poor, then you may need bracing for a period of time to help protect the surgery. And again, to uh, avoid any bending, lifting, or twisting for three months after surgery. And this is to help improve your uh, inflammation and swelling, as well as to promote healing and bony fusion, um, and to uh, uh, have the best outcome as possible. This is the typical timeline for lumbar fusion, and it does you know, take a little bit of time to get recovered. So four to, four to six weeks, you're approximately 60% recovered, 70% recovered at six to eight weeks, 80% recovered at eight to 12 weeks, and then by three to six months, 90% recovered. And, and then it keeps going and gets better and better as the months go on. And, it, and it's pretty similar as before in terms of when the follow-ups are two weeks, then six weeks, 12 weeks, three months, uh, and then six months, one year follow-up, and yearly after that. And I would obtain x-rays at uh, regular intervals to make sure everything is healing nicely. So going home, uh, the process involves uh, a team approach. And typically patients do go home after surgery 
uh, for the majority of patients. Some patients do need uh, acute rehab, depending on how debilitated they are or a uh, skilled nursing facility, but the vast majority of patients can go home. And so the professionals in the hospital, the doctors, the nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, case managers, social workers, they will all be evaluating you daily to make sure that they understand what your needs are so that you can go home. And if you do go home, that you're safe to be home. And we determine if you do need home health or home nursing, home physical therapy, occupational therapy to help with your postoperative course. If you need any assistive devices, that'll be determined, like a walker or a cane, crutches. And if you're getting out of a car or going up and down stairs, then they will work with you on that and the proper way of doing this without violating the BLTs. In terms of wound care, this is one of the most common questions that I get uh, after surgery, is how do I take care of my wound? And some patients, they don't shower for weeks until I see them, and that's not a, a good thing because you do want to keep your wounds clean and dry. It's okay to shower 24 hours after surgery. You will have a waterproof dressing that uh, is covering the wound placed after, at the time of surgery and this dressing can be removed at the f after the 48 hour point. And then there will be steri strips that are covering the wound as well and that is protecting the wound. And uh, you can just let soapy water run over the in steri strips uh, when you do take showers. Now, if there is drainage from the wound, then you'll need to replace the dressing daily. So with 4x4 gauze and tape, and you really want to make sure that uh, the wound stays dry. So that means you can pat the wound dry after showering and no submerging under, underwater until you're cleared by your surgeon. And typically for me, that's when the scar looks like a well-healed scar, that it does not look like there's any uh, residual healing left to go. And please do not use any creams, ointments, or lotions and place them on the wound because that uh, can create an environment, a moist environment, that bacteria would like to uh, inhabit. And so we'd like to keep things nice and dry. In terms of discharge medications, we would use the same medications, ideally, that you were uh, using in the hospital. That would help control your pain. And so opioid pain medications that work for you, stool softeners, because these opioids are constipating and so you should be uh, uh, aggressively uh, taking fiber using these stool softeners to help promote bowel movements, and muscle relaxants as needed or anti-inflammatories as needed. And this would be prescribed and given to you before your discharge. And then you can restart your home medications as directed by your surgeon as well as by your primary care physician. And so you can restart blood thinners three to five days after surgery if you can. And so uh, that's a, a de it depends on the situation. So if it's urgently needed, it can be started earlier. If it can wait uh, to restart uh, the blood thinners, then that would be ideal because uh, you know it, it could start bleeding uh, in the surgical area, which would uh, uh, not be uh, ideal. When to call. Patients should call if they're having worsening drainage, redness uh, of the wound, fevers, chills, or sweats, any signs and symptoms of infection. When they're having worsening nerve pain and symptoms, uh, numbness, tingling, weakness, any bowel and bladder incontinence, all numbness around the buttocks, those things are emergencies and they would need to be known right away. If you're having difficulty breathing, worsening swallowing, especially with cervical surgery, then that's an emergency as well and needs to be notified uh, right away. If you have any headaches that worsen with being upright, that get better with lying flat, that could be a spinal headache and that could be reflective of a spinal fluid leak. And so this would be something that can occur after surgery and is one of the known risks of surgery. And so this we would need to know right away so that we can help take care of the problem. What are the ways to contact? Well, the, uh, the best way to contact is the My UCLA Health portal because it has secure messaging. And so this is uh, something that I can uh, access 24 hours um, and it, I actually get notifications on my phone um, like I would get an email. And so then I would be able to re reply to you as soon as I get the uh, message. Uh, you can also call the office with in, in the regular business hours and you can talk to my assistant who has my speed dial as well and she would be able to uh, help you with any problems or questions uh, that occur after surgery. And if it's urgent and it, or an emergency, then you should call the hospital operator at this number, 
424-259-6700 and ask for the doctor on call for the orthopedic spine surgery and they would be able to handle any issues or contact me if necessary uh, 24 hours a day. So this would be for urgent issues anytime and then for uh, in the after hours uh, uh, if needed. Well, that concludes my talk, and I remind you to ask questions on Twitter uh, with hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. And uh, I will entertain any questions at this time. Thank you. So the first question is, what is the success rate of spinal surgery? And this is uh, dependent on the pathology and the problem causing uh, uh, the symptom. And so what is the reason why you're doing the spine surgery? Uh, you know, if it's because of a, a lumbar disc herniation that you need a lumbar microdiscectomy, then the success rates published in, this, in, the, in the literature as well as my uh, experience in my practice is over 90% success. You know, if it's for back pain, for uh, lumbar uh, spondylosis or arthritis in the back, then surgery is not very effective in that because there's so many different things that can cause back pain in terms of the bones, the discs, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the joints. There are so many factors that go into back pain that if we don't have a singular cause that we can identify and then address in terms of surgery, then the success rate then diminishes significantly. So it really depends on the, the, the pathology and, and the problem at hand. And so that's where uh, a, uh, a thorough evaluation by your spine surgeon to help understand the problem and understand what's causing the pain and then coming up with good solutions for that, whether that's surgery or non-operative treatment. The next question is, how long does it take to recover from spinal surgery? Well, I hope I answered that question depending on the type of surgery um, uh, that uh, we perform. And during this talk, we discussed the most common surgeries and then any of the surgeries that are uh, uh, not within the uh, list of surgeries that I just discussed, um, it can vary. And so other surgeries such as uh, uh, spinal fusion for scoliosis can take time and can take up to a year to full, uh, fully recover from that kind of surgery. And so uh, depending on the amount of uh, surgery that's performed. And when is sur spinal surgery necessary versus a visit to a chiropractor or other non-surgical approaches? Uh, sp spinal surgery is necessary if you have uh, spinal cord problems as well as spinal nerve uh, compression or, or issues causing uh, symptoms such as radiating pain, numbness, tingling, weakness, nerve-related symptoms. And that's where spinal surgery is most effective. If it's pain, like neck pain or back pain, then that can be treated non-operatively to start. And then if the pain evolves into nerve-related pain, then perhaps surgery would be beneficial at that point. Um, and so a chiropractor uh, would be a reasonable thing to do for back pain. And, um, you know, and if that's all uh, in terms of symptoms with no radiating leg pain or nerve-related issues, I think chiropractic treatment is, is a reasonable thing. I would also recommend physical therapy, acupuncture, you know, ac uh, anti-inflammatories, rest, ice, and heat. All of those things can be helpful to help reduce your pain and symptoms. So that's all the, the time for this talk, and I uh, appreciate your time, uh, and uh, thank you for paying attention.